guys. Can I get my microphone on? Oh, thank you. So before I get started, I want to extend a warm Simchat Yisrael welcome to all our visitors. If you're a visitor here, can you just kind of raise your hand so we can see you? Speaking of visitors, I saw Rabbi Stewart try to sneak in here. You he thought you could sneak in un unannounced. So if it isn't obvious by now, uh, public speaking is a big part of my job. It, it's not for everybody I hear. It's, uh, uh, I hear it's one of the, the top 10 biggest fear, phobias in this country, but I think it's my favorite part of the job. I, I, just, I, just like, I like just being in front of people, talking to a crowd. I don't like talking to individuals, but I, I like talking to like 100 people. So, but public speaking isn't a, it's not a one-way street. See, it may seem like I'm just talking to you while you all just sit there listening to me, but really, you guys are communicating with me just as much as I'm communicating with you. So while I'm talking, I'm constantly scanning the room, watching your reactions to me. I see the people who are watching me intently, and I see the ones who are sleeping. You know who you are. I see the ones taking notes, and I see the ones on their cell phones charity. <laughs> Your feedback, it, it's super important to me, and it helps me not, not just to encourage me, but it helps to shape me into a better speaker. So speaking of feedback, there were once three rabbis who were discussing the feedback they received from their latest sermons. So the first rabbi said, you know, I found, uh, I found, I found a great book of knock-knock jokes, and, and I used a ton of humor in my sermon, and my congregation, you know, they really connected, and they were laughing and enjoying themselves. And the second rabbi said, well, well, I put a ton of research into my sermon. I studied Mishnah and Kabbalah and found all these deep connections within the Torah. And my congregation, they were fascinated. And they were taking notes and asked for more information when it was over. And the third rabbi, he said, well, after I gave my late last sermon, you know, I looked up and everyone in my congregation was in tears. And the other two rabbis you know, looked at him in fascination. And, and, you know, I'm, I put myself into this story now because cause I've gotten laughs from you guys and I've got some good research in and I think I've interested some folks, but to touch an audience on such a deep emotional level that you leave them in tears, you know, that's, that's like a whole new level. So the first two rabbis, you know, asked, well, what did you do? And the third one said, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. All I did was read from the Torah and when I was done, everyone was crying. I'm sorry, that wasn't a joke if you were waiting for, for a punchline. There's no punchline. It's, like, it's not a joke, but it is a true story. I see, there once was a sermon where all someone did was read from the Torah and left the whole audience in tears. And uh, funny thing, we, we, didn't, we didn't collaborate beforehand. Dorothy, actually, while she was up here davening, she quoted from that exact Torah portion, uh, from that story from the Bible. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, you can turn to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8. It's one of the last books of the Hebrew Bible. And so, so the setting is the Jews are coming back to the land after a 70-year exile imposed on them by the king of Babylonia. So 70 years before this, the temple had been destroyed, but now a few of the first pioneers are coming back to the land of Israel with the scribe Ezra and the governor Nehemiah in an attempt to rebuild the second temple. And we read that all the people were gathered together in the plaza, and Ezra took out a Torah scroll. Maybe the first time a Torah had been unrolled in Jerusalem in 70 years. And from morning until noon, Ezra read the Torah to the people, starting at Genesis and the story of creation through the patriarchs, the exodus from Egypt, the giving of the Torah, and Moses' final words to Israel. And when he's finished, he looks up and sees that all the people who had been listening were weeping. So what happened here? Why were the Israelites weeping when they heard the Torah? All right, listen, if, if I preach a six-hour sermon to you guys, you're all going to be crying tears of relief when I'm finished, but, but I, I don't think that's what's happening here. So the great medieval commentator Rashi has an explanation for us. You guys can bring that up on the thing. Thank you. Uh, he tells us that the people were weeping in grief because upon hearing the words of the Torah, they realized they had not been upholding the laws that God had commanded them. And uh, you know, that's a very valid explanation, but I'd like to present a different interpretation. You see, we're given a very important but easily overlooked detail about this story right at the beginning. In verse 2, we read that all this happened on the first day of the seventh month. Now, if you know your Jewish calendar and the way the months are ordered liturgically, you know that the day they are talking about is the first of Tishrei. 
making Nehemiah 8 the earliest record we have of the celebration of Rosh Hashanah. See, Rosh Hashanah is the, it's the Jewish New Year, but, it, but it, it's more than that. It's the celebration of God recreating the world and of all the things, all things being made new again. It's a time when God gives us back the things that we have lost and for us to discover who we are again. So 70 years earlier, you know, in our story, 70 years earlier, the temple had been destroyed and the Torah scrolls burned and the Jews torn from their land. But now on this Rosh Hashanah, God has restored his children to their land and given them back their Torah. God was making all things new again. If that's not occasion for tears of joy, I don't know what is. So our congregation, uh, Rosh Hashanah, is right around the corner. And I want this holiday to be as significant for us today as it was for our ancestors all those years ago. I want us to get that same renewal of hope, that same revival of spirit that they did. But getting there is a journey. When Shabbat ends, when this Shabbat ends, it will mark the first day of the month of Elul the month of preparation for the High Holy Days. Elul is a time to search our hearts and draw close to God. Over the next 30 days, Jews around the world will be doing teshuva. Teshuva is usually translated as repentance, but really what it means is, is to return. So a little story for you guys. When I was a teenager, I took this outdoor survival class, and we had to learn to do something called orienteering. It was super, super fun. So, we were, so they dropped us in the woods with like no food or water and with a topographical map and a compass, and we had to try to just find our way out. I, I had a weird idea of fun back in those days. So now if you can use a compass, you should be okay. But the thing about orienteering is you can't just check the compass once and just go about your merry way. You need to hold it in your hand, and as you're walking, you're constantly, constantly checking on it to make sure that you are going and that you're staying in the right direction. So teshuva works the same way. When we do Teshuvah, we are constantly checking our direction, and making sure that the way we are going leads towards God. So just like Jews in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, just as they return to the land, uh, to Torah and to God, we have an opportunity in this next month to do Teshuvah, to return to God, and to get back the things that we have lost and discover who we are again. But how do we do that? Well, the great thing about Judaism is that there is an answer literally for everything. So there are some very specific things that Jews do in the month of Elul to prepare for Rosh Hashanah. So today I'd like to go over just a few of them, and maybe, just maybe if we do these things, our holiday can be as meaningful for us as it was for our ancestors. Right? So let's look at a few things that Jews do on Elul. So step one, wake up, hear the sound of the shofar. So starting tomorrow on the first of Elul, and every day of the month, except on Shabbat, Jews blow the shofar every day during the month of Elul. Now I, I visit, I don't know if you guys have done this before, I visited some Messianic congregations where they, they go a little nuts with the shofar, and they just blow it on like every occasion. Service is starting. Was that a great sermon? Onegas serve. So they, do, they, so they go a little crazy. But if you're following traditional Jewish customs, you can, you can just finally annoy your neighbors and blow your shofar till you're blue in the face this month. So that's your thing. So the Talmud teaches that after Israel sinned with the golden calf, Moses went to the top of Mount Sinai to beg God for forgiveness on Israel's behalf. So in response, God gave Moses two new tablets with the Ten Commandments written on them, and he sent them back down the mountain. And Moses' return journey started on the first day of Elul, and lasted 40 days until Yom Kippur. And every day of his journey was accompanied by blasts of the shofar from heaven. And so today, we remember his journey by blowing the shofar in a lull. It's a nice story, but there is a deeper and more spiritual reason that we blow the shofar as well. See, in biblical times, the shofar was blown in a city as a warning of coming danger. The shofar was a wake-up call for people to pay attention. So today we blow the shofar as a spiritual wake-up call. The shofar reminds us that God is coming soon and we need to be ready for him. And there's this beautiful Jewish folk legend that illustrates how deeply connected the shofar is to the idea of teshuva, to returning to God. 
So uh, in a little Jewish village in Russia lived a young boy. His name was uh, Moshele, looks similar to my son's name. So even though he was just a little boy, Moshele loved studying Torah and Talmud with the scholars of the synagogue, and he spent as much time there as he could. But Moshele was, was an orphan, and he had no father or mother. So fortunately, he was well-loved by the town folk, and everyone in town would donate little objects to him, like string and combs and trinkets. And Moshele would put these things into a basket, and he would walk to the neighboring Christian villages and sell them so that he could earn money and make a living. Now, this is a, this is a hard job for a little guy. And, uh, and one winter, as he was trudging through the snow to sell his wares, Moshele started to get really, really tired, how you can become in the, in the cold sometimes. And he sat down by a tree stump to rest for just a moment. And, but before he knew it, he had fallen asleep in the bitter cold. And as he lay there slowly freezing, uh, a Christian farmer happened by and saw the, the still form of the boy covered in snow. Uh, so the farmer quickly carried the boy back to his home, and he warmed it by the fire until the cold left Moshele's body. But the next morning when Moshele woke up, the farmer and his wife asked him what his name was and where he was from. And Moshele, to his surprise, could not remember his name, or where he was from, or who he was. The cold must have somehow damaged his brain or something. So the farmer decided just to take Moshele in, and the farmer named him Peter. And so the newly dubbed Peter stayed with the farmer through the winter and helped him plant and grow his crops through the spring and the summer. And in the fall, they harvested the crops and set out to sell the foods in the neighboring villages. So one day they drove their cart into a, the Jewish village that Moshele came from. Now remember, he doesn't, he doesn't remember who he is. Now the farmer is dismayed when he gets there because he, he can't sell anything because apparently today was a holiday called Rosh Hashanah or Rosh Hashanah, no, no, no. So they, uh, he couldn't pronounce it. But uh, he, he wanted to leave, but Peter, he just couldn't take his eyes off the synagogue. You know, there was something so familiar about that building. So Peter runs off from the farmer, and he, he steps through the doors, and he sees the, the sights of the synagogue, and he hears the cantor singing, <coughs> and, and, and he hears the sounds of the praying. And everything's coming back to him. He doesn't know what it is. All of a sudden, he hears the words, Takiya! And at that moment, the shofar was blown, and Moshele wakes up. He remembers his name, he remembers who he was, and he remembered that he was a Jew. And that's the end of the story. And the shofar is our great wake-up call. The shofar reminds us that we are Jews, it reminds us who we are, it reminds us that we belong to God. And through the month of Elul, it, is a remi it reminds us to stop, check our compasses, and turn our direction back towards God. Yeah. So we blow the show for him during the month of the law for that reason, but we do some other stuff too. Uh, step two, we do, can you put up step two for me please? Thank you. Repentance, the salichot prayers. So another way that uh, Jews prepare for Rosh Hashanah during the law is the recitation of the salichot prayers. So salichot literally means forgiveness. These prayers, uh, you know, which, you know, if you like, you can find them in our high holiday siddur, and they, they focus on asking for God's mercy. All right, listen, I'm, I'm going to shoot straight with you guys here. Blowing the shofar is fun. We're exciting this sleek coat. It's, uh, it, it's less fun. So uh, you guys might be familiar with some of these prayers, like the, uh, the Ashamnu, uh, which we, we say this every year on Yom Kippur. And this is the one where we, we beat our chest as we say stuff like, we have transgressed, we have cheated, we have robbed, we have slandered, we have committed evil, we've acted stubbornly, we have acted abominably. I've never acted abominably. I've done the other things. Abominably, that's not one of mine. And, but it goes on and on and on. You see, this is just a small portion of them here. You are literally beating yourself up. And it doesn't feel so good, does it? You know, the sleek coat prayers, they seem kind of they seem kind of heavy, don't they? Like all of these sins are weighing us down and dragging us underneath. Is repentance just about feeling bad? What's the value of doing all this repenting? See, prayers of repentance seem heavy, but there's, I have another story that illustrates that maybe it's the other way around. So, oh, there it is. Once there was a very pious and religious monk who lived in a little house in the center of town. Across the street from him lived a young widow who lived alone. Now, this monk was an observant man, meaning that he looked out his window all the time watching people. 
And this monk noticed that an unusual number of men would come and visit this woman at odd times of the day. And the monk put two and two together and figured out she was earning her living as a prostitute. Now this monk was outraged that such a scandalous thing was happening in his neighborhood. And he confronted the woman as she was leaving to buy groceries. And he scolded her, saying, you are a great sinner. Have you no respect for God? Do you even consider what will happen to you after you die? And the poor woman, you know, she was shaken by the monk's words. And that night, she got on her knees and she confessed her sins to God. And she pleaded with God to forgive her and to help her find another way to support herself. So the woman stopped taking visitors, but weeks went by and she, she just couldn't find another way to earn money. And faced with the choice of starving or going back to prostitution, the woman just had to start receiving visitors again. Now the monk, looking at his window, he noticed, and he was furious, thinking that the woman was just blatantly ignoring his lecture. Then the, so the monk got on his knees, and he prayed that God would punish this adulteress, and he resolved that he was going to keep a record of her sins. So from that day on, every time a man came to visit the woman, the monk would place a stone on a pile to keep count. Now on the other hand, the woman made her own resolution. Whenever she would take a visitor, she would repent before God and ask his forgiveness and for a better way. So weeks and months passed, and the woman prayed every day and night while the monk added stone after stone to his pile. And every day when the woman opened her door or looked out her window, she would be forced to see the growing mountain of her sins. One day, the monk once again confronted her in the street. In front of the whole town, he accused her. How long will you continue to sin? Look! Look at this pile of stones. Every stone represents a mortal sin committed by you, each one worthy of damnation. So the woman was so ashamed and humiliated that she locked herself away in her home and prayed to God to deliver her from her miserable existence. And God heard her prayers. And that very night, he sent the angel of death to collect her soul. But he also decided to take the monk that night as well. So the angel went first to the woman's house and then to the monk's and brought their souls out to the pile of stones. And the monk looked on with satisfaction. At last, he would receive his heavenly reward and he would see the sinner repaid. But then the monk realizes that his soul is sinking into the ground as if it was quicksand. The monk, he tries to struggle his way up, but he's too heavy, he can't get up. And he looks up and he sees that the soul of the woman was floating like a feather, upwards and upwards towards heaven, while he sank down towards hell. And the monk cried out to the angel, Is this your justice? I spent my whole life in devotion, and yet here I am carried off to hell, while that woman who sinned all her life is born aloft to heaven. And the angel replied, God's purposes are always just. You thought that devoting yourself to God meant that you had the right to stand in judgment over others. You were so concerned with other people's sins that you never stopped to consider your own. This woman shed away her sin with pure repentance, and now her soul is as light as a feather. But you have weighed down your soul with all these stones of judgment, and now it is too heavy to lift. Messiah Yeshua said, Come to me, all of you who are weary, and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That woman laid her heavy burdens down at the feet of the Messiah. And in the month of Elul, we have the opportunity to lay down our burdens and lighten our souls. So these Salikot prayers may seem like a heavy burden, but their purpose isn't to weigh you down or make you feel bad about yourself. The Salikot prayers don't actually focus much on our sins. In our Siddur alone, and ours is an abbreviated Siddur, we have about 40 pages worth of prayers, but only one of them is about our sins only one of those pages. The rest of those prayers in this Likot are about God's mercy and how much he loves us and how much freedom we have in him. So the Likot prayers are not heavy. They actually make us light. So one last thing that we do on the month of Elul that I'm going to talk about today. This is a hard one. Seeking forgiveness. So the good news is, on Yom Kippur, God mercifully erases all the sins that we have committed against him. The bad news is, 
we're still on the hook for the sins we've committed against other people. So during the month of Elul, if we really want to come out of this holy day completely clean, we have to actively seek out those who we have wronged in the past year and ask them to forgive us. Now here's the rub when it comes to forgiveness. It is a lot easier to grant forgiveness than it is to ask for it. See, granting someone forgiveness makes you feel good. It unburdens you, and it makes you feel generous. But asking someone forgiveness, that's hard. That takes courage and humility. See, the person you are approaching is likely someone that you are not on good terms with. The person you need forgiveness from might be someone who you think is wrong. And the person you need to forgive, maybe they should be seeking forgiveness from you. But we still have to do it. Because Yeshua tells us that blessed are the peacemakers. So we all know about troublemakers, right? You know, every family has one. If you know who the troublemaker in your family is, it's probably you. See, troublemakers, they hurt people. They tear relationships down. Peacemakers build relationships back up. I'm going to do one more story for you guys. There were once two brothers who lived side by side on their own farms. And the brothers were very close, and they always worked on their farms together, and they shared knowledge and a helping hand to each other in times of need. And these brothers, their farms, were separated by a creek that formed the border between their properties. And every day, as was their custom, the two brothers would come to the creek, each on his own side to talk, and, you know, and to share their day and hang out with each other and eat their lunch. But one day they're down at the creek talking, and a foolish argument breaks out, and it causes a rift to form between them. And, you know, the fight began over a small misunderstanding, which can sometimes happen, but the dispute just dragged on and became an angry exchange of words, and, and hurtful things were said. So the elder brother was so angry that he went home and he got his carpentry tools, and he returned to the spot by the creek where he and his brother met every day, and he built a tall wooden fence between the two properties. Now I never have to see his ugly face again, he thought. Weeks of hurtful silence passed, and the older brother began to regret his words and his actions. Every day he would walk to the spot where he and his brother met, but he could no longer speak to his brother, even to ask forgiveness, not with that fence in between them. So the older brother resolved that there was only one thing to do. Next day, the younger brother was out walking in his fields. You know, he had been terribly hurt when he saw the fence that his brother had built between them. But force of habit brought him to their daily meeting spot. When he arrived, he couldn't believe his eyes. See, the fence was no longer there. In its place, he saw that his older brother driving the last of the nails into a <laughs> wooden bridge over the creek. <laughs> the two brothers met in the middle of the bridge, and they embraced. It's not easy to admit that you're wrong and ask for forgiveness, but in the month of Elul, we have a higher calling. God wants us to tear down fences and build up bridges. Congregation, there are many more traditions that the Jewish people do during the month of Elul, but I don't have time to go over them all. However, on the back table, I have prepared some handouts that go over in more detail some of the customs and traditions of Elul that you, could, that you can do in your home. So uh, when you leave here, please feel free to take them home with you to learn more on your own. But I think instead I will end with one last story of Teshuvah, a really short one. Robert Robinson was an English clergyman who lived in the 18th century. Not only was he a gifted pastor and preacher, he was also a really talented poet and a hymn writer. However, after many years in the pastorate, his faith began to drift. So he left the ministry and he moved to France, throwing himself into the Parisian nightclub scene and indulging himself in sin. As he fell further into you know, one night flings and drunken binges, his life began to lose meaning and hope. And one evening he found himself uh, sharing a carriage with a French woman who had recently become a believer. Knowing that Robinson was an expert on poetry, she asked him his opinion on a poem that she was reading. Come, fountain of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing of your grace. Streams of mercy never failing call for songs of loudest praise. When she looked up from her reading, the woman noticed Robinson was weeping. What do I think of it? He asked in a bro broken voice. I wrote it, but now I've drifted away from him, and I can't find my way back. But don't you see the woman said gently? 
the way back is written right here in your poem. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Robert, those streams are flowing even here in Paris tonight. And that night, Robinson recommitted his life to Yeshua and went on to write the greatest poems of his career. Congregation, this month of a lull, those streams of mercy are flowing even here today. And we can always follow those streams back to their source in our Messiah Yeshua and return once more to him. Congregation, kitiva tiva, tova. May you be inscribed and sealed for a good year. Shabbat Shalom.